What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another fantastic episode of Fraternity. I'm your little brother, Danny, and I'm here with my big brother, Sean. How's everybody doing tonight? And right off the bat, Sean, I think we should get our Australian accents out of the way. What do you think? Because I think we're going to be doing them a lot this episode. I don't have the best Australian accent, but we can try. Why don't you give it a go? Bloody hell. That's about it, I think. (laughs) Hey, that's a winner. (laughs) Well, if you couldn't guess, this month is foreign month. Is that what we want to call it, Sean? Foreign film month? This month is our celebration of international horror. Yes, it is. Yeah, so we're going to be celebrating international horror, and we're starting off with a film from, you guessed it, Australia, titled wolf creek yep we sure are and there will be some fond memories this month but for the most part we are leaning heavily on the fresh perspectives one benefit of doing this podcast is getting to watch movies i've missed overlooked or simply haven't got around to watching i've seen hundreds upon hundreds of horror films but if i'm being entirely honest Not all of those films are going to have a story attached to them. At least not an interesting one. So we're mixing it up this month with our international horror celebration and experiencing new films all month long. I've never seen or owned Wolf Creek. It just didn't really catch my attention when it came out. And I never found the interest to check it out until now. So what about you, Danny? Yeah, had never heard of it. Didn't know what it was about. Uh, The name Wolf Creek almost sounds like a teen drama or something, but it's everything but that. Yeah. (laughs) Well, all right, man. What do you say? We skip the formalities and get right into it, huh? (laughs) Well, before we start, just wanted to say you can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Fraternity. That's at Fraternity. You go over there, like us, retweet us, follow us. We'll be happy to interact with you. We have an email. Fraternity at gmail.com. That's fraternity at gmail.com. You can email us, ask us questions. We'll read you on the podcast. And we have a YouTube channel. Go over to YouTube, type in Fraternity in the search bar, and you'll find our channel where we're uploading previous episodes of the show every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, those episodes go up over there with a little bit of a visual treat. So you just have to go over there and check that out. Hello to anyone that's new to the show. Maybe this is your first episode. I don't know. But if it is, Welcome to the show. I'm Danny. My brother here is Sean, and we love to go through horror of all shapes and sizes, and we hope you stick around. Yeah. If you're listening to Fraternity, we think you are number one. So help us become number one by rating our show on whatever audio streaming service you may be listening to us on. Better yet, leave a written review. We'd love to hear from you. And if we like what you have to say, we just may read it in a future episode. So Danny, the following is based on actual events. 30,000 people are reported missing in Australia every year. 90% are found within a month, but some are never seen again. Classic, this is based on a true story intro here. You gotta love it. We're not going to walk through every bit of build-up here. We have Liz and Christy, two UK tourists in Western Australia. They have a friend, a local named Ben, and we see him buy a car so that they can go on a road trip. And one of the things about these road trip leading to certain Doom films is they often follow a similar script. If I have a small gripe with this film, it's that it is a bit too long, it gets a bit repetitive, It also spends a long time introducing our three protagonists and allowing us to get to know them. Buying cars, hanging out on a beach, going to late night pool parties. It's almost 15 minutes until we get the title card and opening credits as they finally embark on their road trip. I can't say that I love these characters, but I do think they do a really good job of making them seem real. Yeah, this intro here does take a while to get going. And it's a good 30, 45 minutes where we're just really just living with the characters on the road. But I think the film accomplishes making them relatable and also making them somewhat likable. Like you said, you don't love these characters, but 
everyone can relate to being excited about a road trip and also being bored to death on the road of said road trip. So I think the film succeeds there. It is a bit long, but I don't think it's necessarily bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, through this introduction and the first bit of the road trip, it feels like you're almost watching like the real world or a reality show. I think they do a good job of making these characters seem like genuine folks and not movie characters. Yeah, definitely. You can chalk that up to the look of the film, too, because it's shot on digital and it has this kind of grimy digital film look to it that also makes it feel lived in and real. This movie does take place in the 90s, Danny. Can we call that a period piece now? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, doesn't seem right to say it, but you know what? Let's go with it. Yeah, it isn't until we get to Emu Creek where the group stops for gas that we get a bit of drama. And I gotta say, as a Star Trek fan, I do appreciate Ben with his Aussie impression of Kirk doing a captain's log on his camcorder. (laughs) No sign of intelligent life. (laughs) Hey, Ben can't do that good of an American accent. We can't do a good Australian accent. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, as soon as he mentions the no signs of intelligent life, there's this real goober of a gas station attendant that walks up. But this bit is worth mentioning because... There is something visible in the camcorder video that I didn't notice, and I'm sure most people didn't notice on first viewing, but will come to light as an interesting twist later. Yeah, definitely. We then get a tense bit where some nasty locals act wise with Ben when they ask him if he'd be alright with them having a gangbang with the girls. Unfortunately for Ben, this is one giant local yokel, so the best and only move is to simply walk away, because Ben was not going to... Tai Chi is ass. <laughs> <laughs> and just like that, we're back on the road to Wolf Creek, a giant national park that is the site of a massive meteorite crater. It's a cool location. Definitely didn't expect that. Oh yeah, I had no idea about this Wolf Creek place, and they do a really good job of making it seem really grand and like you want to go there. It seems like a really awesome sight to see. As you know, We don't do behind the scenes here at Fraternity. But I did read that this area they filmed in hadn't seen rain for over six years. But once the crew arrived, it rained nonstop for three days. So they worked it in and dealt with it. I only bring it up because I think it really worked in their favor. It definitely gives the film a bit more of an ominous, foreboding tone here. Yeah, that's crazy because watching it, I was thinking like, you know, it doesn't seem like this place gets rained that often. Like, how did they schedule around shooting when it was gonna rain? And hearing that now confirms just what happened. So, yeah, that's crazy. They arrive at the crater, park, and hike through the drizzle and have themselves a nice rainy day picnic before Liz and Ben sneak off and share some smoochies. (laughs) I like how pure their, like, kiss feels here. Yeah. Like, Ben just goes and finds... Liz and they share the kiss and they're both everyone knows that feeling of finally confirming your feelings and having them be mutual it's captured really elegantly here yeah well done the group heads back to the car and they oddly discover that their watches have stopped working worse yet though the car doesn't start and Ben is not the manly mechanic type so they end up stranded yeah Ben looks under the hood and quickly realizes he has no idea what he's even looking for (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah he's like we might be spending the night girls and the one's like so fucked and he's like bitch <laughs> another great example of look a road trip isn't always gonna be rosy you know you're gonna get aggravated with the people you're with yeah you're stuck in a car with two other people for hours on end yeah it's gonna get a little heated stuck in the car in the pitch black But it isn't long before they notice an approaching truck. There had been some UFO stories and talk through the movie, so there is this moment where they let their imaginations run wild before realizing it is indeed just a truck. The truck pulls up, and out comes Aussie outbacker Mick Taylor. He's a real crocodile Dundee type, wouldn't you know? What the bloody (laughs) hells is you doing out here? You've scared the shit out of me. (laughs) You got the laugh down, but we're going to have to work on these accents. Yeah. Either way, you get what kind of character Mick is, even with our terrible accents here. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, there are countless plots that exist with setups almost identical to this. Not to mention, we all know why we're watching this movie, but I definitely think they do a good job of making Mick Taylor disarming at first. Yeah, he comes off more friendly than anyone else in the film has. You know, the guy at the gas station, even the gas station attendant was giving off a little creepy vibes. He was overly smiley. So when you first see Mick, you know, all signs point that I shouldn't trust this guy, but I kind of do. Yeah, I do like the fact, though, that the youngsters don't just drop their guard completely. They're a little hesitant, you know? Right. So Mick offers to tow them to his place to fix their vehicle, and the group really has no better options, so they end up accepting. And at this point in the film, I was definitely very interested in seeing what it was going to be like once Mick Taylor switched gears. I was also curious, how was the insanity going to start? There is a question of how does one man get on top of three individuals and overwhelm them? Yeah, and I think the way they go about it is definitely satisfying. Yeah, the answers to those questions are fast approaching as the group drinks water while sitting around a campfire. And we see Mick lives in the remnants of an old mining operation. And we learn a bit about Mick around the fire as well. He was a vermin hunter on a farm. And he shares gruesome, off-putting tales of hunting water buffalo, pigs, and roos. Yeah, he says he's doing the people a favor by killing the kangaroos. Saying they're everywhere, like tourists. <laughs> 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 There's this nice creepy bit where Mick clams up as Ben admires his freedom and compares him to Aussie Outback stereotypes. He doesn't speak up until being asked what he does now, to which he replies, Well, I could tell you but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the unease in this scene, especially because he keeps eyeing Ben, clearly having a distaste for him. And it goes back and forth with like, you're uncomfortable, but then Mick kind of lightens the mood. It's really great stuff. There's also a fantastic bit where Mick lets out a burp and apologizes, but Christy and Ben belch back in kind. And then we get a nice fart from Ben. <laughs> now, I know the burps were real, Danny, but that fart was a bit stock, huh? <laughs> that was a stock fart, and I'm always disappointed because, come on, just somebody fart into the mic and use a real one. Like, it just sounds so much better. Are you volunteering? <laughs> yeah, I'll be in the credits as number one fart boy. Okay, <laughs> I don't mind. Well, Mick Taylor does not like stock farts either because that's the straw that runs him off to work on the car. I love when he sniffs it too and it's just like, ugh, <laughs> disgusted. He's like, damn son, there's ladies present. <laughs> <laughs> so Mick goes to work on the car and the group tucks in for a bit of sleep, which seems a little odd, right? <laughs> yeah, they all tuck in to go to sleep and we see Ben is already passed out and Liz is trying to tell Ben to Get the esky out of the fire, the Eskimo cooler, <laughs> if you didn't know. But she soon falls asleep as well. So, like I said, one of my main curiosities was how is this shit going to hit the fan? Surprisingly, what we get is Liz waking up with her hands and legs bound. Ben and Christy are nowhere in sight. We aren't sure how she's found herself in this situation. And it takes her about all day to gather her composure before she finds a piece of glass that she uses to cut her bonds. Yeah, I like the sense of disorientation, like we're sitting here with Liz, just as confused as she is, and what the hell happened to her. Shoes gone, she's zip-tied on the feet and the hands, and is in this storage closet of some sorts. Yeah, so our structure of terror here is that of Liz sneaking around this site as the horror becomes more prevalent around her. The car engine has been deconstructed, not to mention she has no idea where she is really. But then she hears the screams of her friend Christy coming from another building. Liz is able to find a vantage point and finds Christy tied to a support beam and being tormented by Mick. I mentioned how I was interested in seeing this character once he made that villainous turn. And what I ended up liking about it was it, it wasn't some grand guignol turn. He's pretty much the exact same person just stripped of the false pretenses of being friendly or helpful. Yeah, I really like that about Mick, too, is that 
he's basically acting exactly the same. You know, he's cracking jokes, but he's also confirmed to be a murderer and wielding a rifle and decapitates young women. He torments Christy with a rifle and clearly has rape on the mind. It's also very effective seeing the cheerful tourist Christy reduced to this bloody and battered screaming victim. That's definitely part of the brilliance in having us spend so much time with these characters before we got to this point. It's almost disarming, but at the very least it definitely adds poignancy to these scenes. Yeah, I think it works really well that we get to live with these characters for 45 minutes, and then we just get to see that optimism completely crushed by Mick here. Liz ends up causing a distraction by setting a fire to the car and causing an explosion to draw Mick out and buy Christy some time. She sneaks in there and comforts her for a moment, and we catch a glimpse of this nasty rotting cadaver just in case we didn't realize Mick was insane. (laughs) Mick is out there putting out the fire. Rule number one, put out the bloody fire. Fuck's sake. Doesn't he even say about the headless corpse? He's like, me and her got along real well till she lost her head. (laughs) We were great together. Just she lost her head. (laughs) Liz ends up having to hide beneath Mick's workbench as he returns. And he picks up where he left off with Christy, pulling a knife on her, rubbing his crotch in her face. He threatens to, I'll cut your tits off. Before we hear the sound of the rifle and Mick turns to find Liz aiming at him. Christy laughs in his face as Mick remains cocky and tries to tell Liz that the gun isn't loaded. He tells Lizzie, Now, a rifle in the wrong hands can be really dangerous. So give me the fucking... And bang. The surprises keep coming because a bullet rips right through Mick's neck. (laughs) Yeah, this part is kind of crazy because it almost feels like the end of a movie. There's no way this is the end, but it really feels, you know, like a climax. But really, this is just the beginning of the horribly scary third act here. We see Mick clutch the wound before collapsing, and Christy urges Liz to shoot him again, but there's no more rounds in the rifle. And then she annoyingly beats him across the back a few times, and I'm like sitting there screaming, Liz, crush his skull. Or the the knife. knife. (laughs) Yeah, minus one for uh, protagonist incompetence. Liz puts Christy in Mick's truck before having to go back and fish the keys out of his pocket as he lay there unconscious. She starts the engine, but Mick opens the door to this building, clutching his neck in one hand and a shotgun in the other. He ends up blowing out the windshield before the girls attempt to run him over as he reloads. They then drive off into the darkness of the outback. The problem is these girls have no clue where they are, and it is pitch black wilderness out here. We see Liz grab the keys, put it in the ignition, start the car, and we see the girls really like joyous and happy for a split second, only to be met by Mick with his double-barreled shotgun as he shoots out the windshield. And this starts a trend of every small victory that these characters get against Mick is going to be immediately crushed and consumed by evil yet again. There's quite a few trends in this latter half. It's good stuff, but... It does get a bit repetitive. Like, this won't be the last time we see someone fishing for keys, clutching an engine, (laughs) you know? As they drive through the darkness, they notice lights of a vehicle in pursuit of them, but then they drive up to a ridge and come to a halt. The two of them decide to push the truck over the edge, and we get a great crash sequence with a sacrificial camera capturing the plunge from inside Mick's truck. Then we get a great tense scene where the girls hide on the ridge as Mick arrives in search of them. Some good tension here before Mick works his way down to the crash scene to inspect for the girls or their bodies. And at this point, they have no choice but to return for another vehicle as Liz has a set of multiple keys. And we get a brief glimpse of the still unconscious Ben here as Liz decides to leave the fatigued and failing Christy behind. So Liz returns to the site alone. Liz leaves Christy and assures her she'll be back in just five minutes, but it's going to be a lot longer than five minutes. Yeah, back on site, Liz immediately arms herself with a revolver and immediately loses it when she inspects an enclosed area that leads down to the mine below. She was searching for Ben, I assume, but she finds a nasty body pit full of decaying former victims and other skeletal remains. 
I do like this bit because it feels very survival horror. But at the same time, this is where the film does become slightly repetitive, if you ask me. Like, did we really need the body pit? We already know this guy's nuck and futs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Liz finds this shed full of cars and a stockpile of belongings, including family photos and passports. She inspects a camcorder and watches as similar events play out to a family with their vehicle breaking down and Mick arriving to offer assistance. They're towed to the same site and offered water from Mick. Rainwater from the top end. Rainwater from the top end. Liz then finds the tape of Ben doing his Captain Kirk impersonation, and it's here that we notice Mick's truck in the background, revealing how orchestrated and not spontaneous all of this really is. Yeah, this is the twist that I really like, is that there wasn't really anything that they could do to escape what was going to happen to them. Mick was already on their trail, already planning everything out. Yeah, it definitely changes the story up, for sure. Yeah, it's a slick reveal. And speaking of slick, Liz gets in a car, attempts to start it, and as soon as the engine fires, we hear, <laughs> from the back seat. And Mick shoves a knife through that seat, and the blade runs completely through Liz. She stumbles out of the vehicle and fumbles with a pocket knife, but as we know, that's not a knife. What Mick has in his hands, now that's a knife. This is a knife. He takes a swipe at Liz as she unwisely raises her hand and consequently has several of her fingers cut off. Ooh, oh man. Oh, finger horror. One of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brutal. He wants to know where Christy is and begins to threaten her with an old war trick for interrogation before punching her in the face. He's like, Now this is for wrecking me fucking truck. <laughs> 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 he then turns Liz into a head on a stick by severing her spine and asking her where Christy is off to. We never see Liz again after this, but we can assume or rather hope that she wasn't made to suffer much longer after this. I thought Liz's death was really interesting because to me she was given off final girl vibes from the very beginning. So to see her go off first definitely made the movie all the more intriguing for me. I was like, man, now I really don't know where this film is going. Yeah, it was definitely surprising. This movie is very good at delivering surprises in this horror sequence. But speaking of Christy, we see her come to and take off running. She runs through the night and finds a main road by daylight. Some hapless old man comes across her and attempts to offer assistance. He puts her in the back of his car and fetches a drink and a blanket. But we hear a distant shot ring out and the man notices a bullet has torn through his mug. A second shot rings out and the road is splattered with this unfortunate man's brains as he goes down. Christy realizes what's going on. And we get the familiar story beats of oh shit trouble to oh shit the keys and so on and so forth. And she takes off down the street as Mick decides to play a game of cat and mouse with her. I do love when Mick pulls up beside her and he playfully acts like he's listening to music and just out for a drive before feigning surprise as if he just recognized a familiar face. Yeah, I really love Mick just mocking Christy here. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. And... Christy manages to run him off the road, though, and leave him in a ditch, but Mick gets out of the car and proceeds to shoot the rear tire out of Christy's vehicle, causing it to skid out of control into a ditch as well, and then it flips over before coming to a dead stop. And then we get a roadside execution here, as Mick murders Christy before placing her body in a trunk with the old man and lighting the vehicle on fire. So that's the end of the girls, Danny. Finally, we get to see where Ben has been this entire time. Ben has been crucified, Danny. By what kind of nails or what those are, I don't know, but it looks really painful. <laughs> very, very long nails straight through his wrists. And he wakes up and he's excruciatingly pulling them, his hand off of the nail. And it's just gruesome to watch. Yeah, gruesome is the right word. That's what I said, too. It's gruesome. And then we see him escape and wander through the outback for what seems like days before finally collapsing alongside a dirt road. And this traveling couple discovers his body and pick him up to rush him to help. 
And we see Ben airlifted for further evaluation, I'm assuming. And the last shot we see is of Ben in custody with a somber look on his face, heading to what looks like a trial or something. And we learn that despite several major police searches, no trace of Liz or Christy has ever been found. The early investigations were disorganized and hampered by a lack of physical evidence of concrete knowledge of the location. And this caused police to cast Ben as an unreliable witness. We learned that after four months in custody, Ben was finally cleared of suspicion and released. We then see a rifle-toting Mick Taylor wandering through the outback at sunset. And that's the end of our movie. So, Sean, since this was a first watch for you, what were your thoughts on Wolf Creek? I'm not sure how I overlooked this movie. Maybe I thought it was just too similar to some of the stuff coming out around that time. But upon watching it, I do believe that it succeeds in finding its own voice. I feel like it has more in common with a thriller or an exploitation film. And when you combine those two genres, you definitely end up with a dreadful horror experience like the one that Wolf Creek delivers. I love how unflinching and unapologetic this film is. It's satisfyingly surprising and brutal. It's a bit too long. It gets a bit repetitive. But if you've overlooked this film like I have, I wholeheartedly recommend it. I really liked this movie. What about you, Danny? Awesome. Well, I feel the same way. I think this movie is great. It lures you in with a relatable journey and story, a fun road trip. But the film quickly demolishes all that fun and all that hope. And each tiny victory that we get from our characters is overcome ultimately by evil. And all this evil was planned out. It was always going to happen. But in the end, by chance, Ben is able to escape with his life. Reassuring that maybe there is good in the world, even with all the pure evil like Mick. And the movie ends on a somber note, one not shy of the evil that lurks in this world. And I think it's a really unique horror film. I love the setting of Australia and how close we get to feel these characters and how everything in their path just gets demolished once Mick shows up on screen. It is a bit too long, but like you said, if you can overlook the length, it's a great watch. Check it out. Awesome, man. So... I know there's not much to choose from, but do you have a favorite kill? This is another one where favorite kill seems a bit morbid, (laughs) but let's do it. It is a bit morbid, but not morbid enough in my opinion. So I still think these kills are pretty fun and entertaining, but my personal favorite, I gotta go with Christy. I love the silhouette shots of Mick in his car as you see his outline with his signature hat. And as we talked about earlier, I love him when he catches up with Christy finally and mocks her. And it just reiterates that hopelessness throughout the whole film. You know, Mick just easily catching his target. But I love too that we almost see a more serious side of Mick when he's executing Christy. It's almost like he's cleaning up his mess. You know, this has gotten out of hand. And he's just putting Christy down as if she were just a mere animal. You know, it's as if, I mean, he doesn't see her as equal at all as another life. He's just getting rid of her because this has gone on for too long and turned into this chase he never intended to have. That's a great choice. And what I'll say about the Christie kill is it really brings that realism because it's not often in horror that we see gun violence, you know, and he just executes her with this rifle. And then even puts another shot in her. And it's no holds barred, man. It's brutal. It's savage. That's why I say it's more like an exploitation or thriller. Because these are not fantastical kills. These are gritty, down-to-earth, nasty, real kills here. Yeah, you're just seeing them sociopath just get rid of somebody it's not enjoyable but that's what makes mick such an interesting character is because he has that playful side to his personality but he's also this evil twisted mind on the other end and it's he's just fascinating to watch i will say i think he was just regretting not getting his nut off with christy though (laughs) (laughs) he was like she was gonna be his plaything, dude and he's like damn it (laughs) y'all really fucked up my plans So, Sean, how about you give us a favorite scene? Well, 
while we don't get the actual kill, I have to choose Liz getting turned into a head on a stick. <laughs> it's not often that a film surprises me, but this was a fantastic blindside. Totally shocking sequence to have who has been set up as our main protagonist. Not just killed, but she ends up getting done in first. And like I said, I love how unapologetic and unflinchingly brutal this film is. And is that essence captured any better than when we see Liz get her fingers hacked off? And then the head on a stick bit. It's not the most gruesome thing you're ever likely to see, but the way Mick talks us through it before actually doing it, it just puts that idea in our head and makes it all the more brutal for it. Telling can be worse than showing, and it takes us to this point where we have to hope she's killed soon and not left to suffer like this at the whims of Mick. Like I said, it's where I was really interested in the film. I was like, man, I have no idea where this is going because I really expected Liz to make it to the end and having her killed when there's still 20, 30 minutes on the runtime. It's just like, man, that's hats off to you for having the balls to do something different. Definitely, man. Well, cool. We got them both covered. But how about a favorite scene? Well, my favorite scene is when the group and Mick are all chatting by the campfire. <laughs> nice choice. Nice choice. Like we talked about earlier, at this point, you're still kind of unsure about Mick's motive. I mean, you think he's a murderer, but at the same time, you're like, maybe something different is going to happen. And it's just a fun scene with Mick being Mick, you know, being an Aussie, cracking jokes, telling gruesome stories about killing vermin, mean mugging Ben, burping. It's great, and it's the last little bit of humanity we have in this film before it all turns to terror. Don't forget the stock fart, Danny. And the poo-poo. And the stinky poo-poo. Doo-doo. Fart. <laughs> awesome. Good choice. I will say, that's a great choice. I, on the other hand, have to go with where Liz first gets free and finds Christy being tormented by Mick. And then Liz doing her thing and distracting Mick before shooting him through the neck. Like I've said, I was really interested in seeing how the Mick Taylor character would be once his facade was dropped and he became the killer that we knew he was. Plus, I kept wondering how things were going to get started. How was this film going to introduce us to the horror it had in store? I think it lived up to my expectations as well as kept me guessing. And I just love how quickly all of this transpires. I don't think you would have much time to think and act in this situation, and that's what we see here. And then they even have Liz shoot Mick through the neck, and it's the first sign that anything and everything is possible here. From that point on, you have no idea what to expect or where things could go, much less where it's all gonna end. So, it starts with a bang and just keeps going. Nice. Yeah, that's a great scene. Every scene with Mick is filled with tension and dread, so any of them would be good picks, and that scene is just as good as a pick as any. Well, all right, man. That was Wolf Creek. We hope everyone enjoyed our trek to Australia, and we hope you tolerated our piss-poor Australian accents. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see you next time, mate. Yep, that's going to do it for us, folks. We will see you next week when we head just slightly north to Canada. Hope to see you there. Good night, everybody. Good night.